Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is December 11th, 2014, and I am, I hope to God, finally over this horrible cold that I've been dealing with for like three weeks. My plan was to record, uh, I guess I'm actually on week four now. My plan was all I've got left is a hacking cough, which I can just edit out. So, uh, four weeks ago or so, I was in the midst of the Abolethic Sovereignty Trilogy, and I thought I would record on that. However, uh, with this cold, I, I've been just kind of down for quite a while, and one of the things that I've done is gotten quite a bit of reading done. So, we're going to actually talk about the Abolethic Sovereignty Trilogy as a whole here today. That's right, the Abolethic Sovereignty starring your favorite character and mine, Rhydon Kane. So, Rhydon Kane. He's a monk, <laughs> hanging out, 1385, going back to see his daughter, who's about four years old, I believe. And Spell Plague comes along, and he is trapped in amber or something like that for ten years. So he wakes up, and it's 1396, and he's like, oh crap, everything's changed, right? So he goes, and uh, he looks to find his daughter to make sure she's okay, and she is, in fact, dead. So here's my problem with this whole subplot. I mean, I'm... You know, I'm okay with tragedy in the realms, obviously. I mean, I like Night Parade, uh, for the love of God. But the problem I had with this storyline was I kept thinking in Stardeep, which, he, which you know... Ride on, Kane ...was in before. Was his daughter, his adopted daughter, ever mentioned? I don't remember her being mentioned. So, either one of two things. One, she was mentioned and I just forgot about it and it's so immaterial that's how much it mattered. But Cordell had to deal with that um, subplot, that, that, that idea somehow. And this was the easiest way to do it. And it also gives Ride on Kane some extra angst. The other option, however, is that it wasn't mentioned... And I'm not crazy, and uh, there was no real reason to include this. I mean, it just seemed like, why the hell is this here? It doesn't add anything to the story. You know, the character is still pretty messed up and out of place, even without the damn dead daughter. Throughout this book, he's reintroduced to Sinashur uh, from Stardeep. And I remember, actually, the point in the first book, I, I did try reading it long ago, because I thought the Abolesks were kind of Cthulian, and I enjoy that, so I tried to read this long ago. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing probably pretty soon after it first came out. And there's a point where... Ride on, Kane Says to Sinashur, basically, yeah, I'm gonna go find this sword, and I'm gonna do the big quest, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And I remember reading it... I was kind of enjoying the fact that it seemed so messed up and so just random, and I was like, oh, here's where it turns into a basic fantasy book. Man, was I wrong <laughs> at that time. I'm not necessarily saying these are this trilogy is the best thing ever, but it is not your typical fantasy book or, or trilogy. I'm not sure how much detail I want to go into on plot. In the first book, it's it's separated between his quest and... Uh, I can't remember her name, but a, uh, uh, a Sahagwan or a sea elf or some damn thing who's trying to get this MacGuffin. And it's 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 been a while now since I actually read these. And as I say, I didn't love, love, love them. But I didn't hate them either. I just uh, had a few problems, which I'll, I'll get into once I kind of go through at least a basic plot summary so you know what's going on. So there's this thing called the Eldest. And the Eldest is essentially Cthulhu. Except instead of being on Rhydaleth, he's on this city called Zizafu. <laughs> and so I kept thinking the second book should have been called The Call of Zizafu. But sadly it was not. And and uh, that being because essentially all of book two is them hanging out in Zizafu or trying to get towards Zizafu, trying to accomplish one thing or the other. So we've got, uh, we end up having a whole cast of characters. My favorite was Captain Thoster, who is in fact some sort of fish god abomination thing. We've also got uh, Jopheth, who is a, um, a spellcaster who has lost his ability, and he's also a drug addict. No, is it, was it, maybe he wasn't even a spellcaster to begin with, but anyway, he's a drug addict, and so uh, it's this drug that if you get addicted to it, it's going to kill you, and so to get out of that, he makes a deal with some extra planar creature. <laughs> 
it's never i mean i things are just thrown at you left and right uh here and again i'll get into my problems uh with this book at the end so i'll just say that for now i'm trying to remember what he's called the lord of bats or something like that and it just um there it's 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 this twisty turning plot one of the things that i kind of liked is that uh, japheth is kind of on the side of the good guys in book one and then book two his love interest, whose name is absolutely escaping me, who has the power to fall asleep and become like this awesome dream creature, uh, very much like, uh, what, what was that comic, Night Mask, I think, part of the new universe? That's like her power, so she's just quaffing sleeping pills or potions left and right, and uh, it's, it's a very, it's like uh, Return to the Valley of the Dolls, the fantasy novel, or the fantasy trilogy. And I think there's another, uh, there's like a Thean wizard or witch, I guess, uh, who's on the run because, you know, she's she decided not to fight in the war. You can't remember, I don't think Zazzy shows up, but I, I do think he's, he's mentioned and I do think some of his uh, his force shows up at one point or another. Yeah, so book two, Jopheth, uh, the, the, the kind of inciting thing about book two is Jopheth loses, you know, his chick. Let's call her Lyriel, that sounds reasonable, right? Uh, he, she gets trapped. She's like out doing her dream magic thing and her dream form gets trapped in Zizifu, which at the end of book one, one of the most confusing things I've ever read. So Zizifu is miles and miles underneath the ocean, right? It's, you know, it's submerged. And essentially the end of book one is them getting away. You know, uh, they're, they're on the ship that's magically got you know it's got like magic uh, uh varnish on it so it can go through the sea and they're doing this thing and they're escaping from it and they finally get to the uh, uh you know the sea and they're on on back in where they're breathing air and everything and then they look up and in the sky is Zizifu and it's like well did it pass them on the way I I guess it must have they they kind of answer that and uh, book two, and I can't even remember what the damn answer was, but it was like, you know, the end of book one is like, and there in the sky hung Zizifu. And I was just like, how did that happen? That doesn't even make any sense. So we find out who the traitor is uh, from Stardeep, and we find out that backstory, and, you know, it's it's very involved and very deep, and essentially the Abolithic Sovereignty are these horrific creatures from out of time and space very cthulian book three is kind of all about the key of stars which is the macguffin that everybody's been trying to get to through the first two books either to uh, awaken the eldest or and open the door or to destroy so that this door can never be opened essentially it's like there's this door that leads into outer darkness and some plane of horror or whatever and in the old day they made keys for it and uh now it's like uh, there, there's only uh, one left and and two <laughs> and so you know uh, it's like oh we're going to open the door and the abolithic sovereignty is going to come in and everything will fall into disrepair and ruin however ride on Cain has one more of them it's the cerulean scar that he gets on his chest which is kind of sort of spell scar but kind of sort of not anyway and in the last book he meets his mom and Everything kind of ties in very nicely for the plot. Also in uh, book three, I think, is where it's introduced. There's this other monk character who's, I, I think, kind of more interesting, but that's okay. You know, he, he doesn't have to hold three books. Uh, I really liked the fact that... Ride on Kane Goes through some fun stuff, especially, I think it's the... Yeah, it's the beginning of book three, where Lyriel... Again, totally guessing on that name. Uh, Lyriel is, like, trying to get everybody together to take down the big bad Zizifu and... Uh, stop the Abolithic Sovereignty and... and Ride on Cain! ...is just drinking, and Jopheth is doing his own thing because he's got the Lord of Bats coming to try to kill him. And it's like she holds this meeting that's like, how we're gonna take out all the bad guys and move forward and nobody comes. And I was like, I, I really enjoy that. I think that has a, uh, uh, a feeling of verisimilitude to it that you don't see very often. Possibly for very good reasons. Uh, here we go. I, uh, I I was um, looking here to get my quotes queued up, and uh, her name is not Lyriel, it's Anusha. That was way off there. So I highlighted a few bits just to give you a little bit of a taste of this. Uh, the, the first book I had in print rather than ebook, so didn't really get any quotes from that. And apparently I had nothing quotable in book two. But here from book three, this is just a, uh, a, a taste of how Cordell sometimes just... I, I don't know, his writing style just doesn't really agree with me. It's not terrible, but listen to how kind of wordy and strangled this feels. 
He inhaled sharply. If she had come to permanent harm, all these thoughts would crumple into so much dross. His heart would cease beating, he was sure. He'd die. <laughs> so there, just in case that wasn't clear from the fact that, uh, you know, um, his heart would cease beating, he'd die. Also, this phrase from earlier in the book, chasing a chimera of equanimity. <laughs> I mean, okay, but really? I also like this perfectly natural sounding dialogue. I have some experience with psychic phenomena. <laughs> this was, I thought, a really good uh, metaphor. It sounded like dried leaves blowing and scraping across bone. It's evocative, but, you know, do you really? Can I mean, can you picture that in your mind? I guess I kind of can, but what an odd sort of image, right? Oh, and here's here's another one. Again, <laughs> everything that I uh, apparently highlighted in here is just overwrought uh, metaphor. Her dream armor offered no protection from the grasping briars of grief that squeezed her heart. <laughs> I mean, I I just I don't understand how somebody could write that and not kind of laugh and go, yeah, I gotta I gotta redo that. You know, I mean. I, doesn't that just sound, like, so ridiculous to you? I, maybe it's just me, I don't know. Oh, yeah, and I uh, uh, I highlighted this because I was so happy about it. Uh, Foster yells, I am a descendant of Dagon. And I was like, hey, they just out and out mention the Cthulian fish god, Dagon. He's a descendant of Dagon. I did not think any of the Cthulian uh, creatures straight up existed in the realms. And uh, maybe they only did in 4E? I don't know. You know, I... This this trilogy is weird, because it's all in 1396, so it's not technically 4E. Anyway, we'll, we'll get into more of that later. Okay, a couple of quotes here that are getting into the bigger thing that I want to talk about, so I'll, I'll use them, and, and these are the last of the quotes here. So, this is during the final battle where this big door into darkness is opening up, and da 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 Anything beyond the discontinuity, including the citadel of the outer void, lay outside the dominion of the gods. That raises so many questions right there, right? I mean, doesn't that kind of uh, make you wonder what the hell's going on? And then the next one, uh, from the next chapter, The wrath of beings older than Lord Ao splashed against the far side of the Far Manifold. The Far Manifold is the name for this outer darkness thing. So both of those quotes made me question, you know, if Ao is kind of the creator god of this universe, what the hell is outside of his dominion? What could possibly be out there. And are the Cthulian gods more powerful than him? And Thoster's uh, apparently descendant of Dagon. Does that mean that somehow he could best Lord Ow? I, I don't... I, I mean, there's so many questions raised here. And I kind of wish that they just hadn't been raised. You know, if, if, if your own group wants to deal with giant world-shaking events, then then why not? You know, do that, and it's it's your own choice. But to throw stuff like that out there and then never follow up on it, that seems reckless to me, I guess. And I did not really enjoy that. I, for, I didn't enjoy it in the sense of it making a good Realms novel. And that, in fact, leads me to my biggest complaint here, and I'll just throw this out there. This did not, in the slightest, feel like a Forgotten Realms series. There was, like, nothing beyond maybe the first... 30, 40 pages that made it feel like it had anything to do with the realms. Yes, some of the city names and some of the things, you know, mentioned, um, I mean, it obviously takes place in the realms, you know, it's not as if, like, uh, they're in Detroit or something. But it doesn't feel like a realms novel, and that really shocked me, because the realms is so gigantic, so all-encompassing, you know, uh, uh, the the... The Mongol series and the uh, the Incan series, even though I didn't read that one, but I kind of scanned through it. All of those still feel more realmsy than this one does, and I don't know what that why that is. I don't know what it was. I think a lot of it is especially toward the end of book three when they're dealing with these horrors from out of space and time and everything, and it's like I I think that's cool. That's you know. I read uh, Lovecraft and Machen, you know, I've name-checked both of them before here in Realms Remembered, and I, I love all of that stuff. And I liked Night Parade, you know, I like horror in my realms. But this just did not work. Oh, and uh, obviously, um, you know, Undead, uh, uh, Byers, uh, stuff that I like so recently. And this just didn't work for me, and it wasn't that I thought it was horribly written. 
Again, you know, I pointed out some of the more ridiculous pieces. Book 3 especially felt really rushed, which I thought was odd since it didn't have an accompanying anthology with it, which I always assume is one of the reasons why Book 3 in these trilogies feel rushed, because the, uh, the person is having to, or the author is having to deal with the anthology as well. But for, you know, Book 3 felt really rushed. None of, the, none of it really felt like the realms at all. And I don't know if it's because the Spell Plague is now in the past and everything is just different. But, you know, it was like in uh, uh, whichever the second one is, Un Undead, I think, you know, in Undead, yeah, it was post-Spell Plague and things had changed a hell of a lot, but you still, you saw people getting accustomed to it and you saw people dealing with it. And at this point in time, things are just completed, you know? I mean, this is just now the new world we live in. Now, granted, we still have like 70 years to go before we hit like really, really 4E. So maybe this sort of transition period just doesn't feel like the realms and later things will fall back into place. I hope so. You know, we are we are now hitting the crux of the entire reason that I started doing this, and that was because, as I'm sure I've mentioned before, Richard Baker's, uh, whatever that first one is, the Corsair Avenger trilogy. I tried reading that, and I generally really enjoy Richard Baker, and I was just like, God, this does not feel like The Realms. And I am hoping that reading it in order this way will make things feel uh, more natural. And, you know, then I was like, well, why dream small? <laughs> Let's really do it and, and at least try to read everything and start from the beginning. You know, and, and again, Undead did such a good job of making the Spell Plague feel not necessarily organic, because it really was a disruptive event, and everybody has to, uh, uh, you know, change how they think and how they act and how they view magic and so on and so forth, but it made it feel like it was part of the world and the ways that people reacted felt more natural. This just doesn't feel like it's really precisely Cthulian. It doesn't feel like it's very realms. I don't know, maybe like kind of a uh, the realms meets uh, Lord Dunsany, uh, Dunsany, however you say that. You know, it, maybe it's something like that. I don't know. It just, it definitely didn't do much for me. And I was very frustrated because I really wanted to like this. And I, I kind of enjoyed the way the first book had, it felt like two different books for quite a while. And then by book two, we're really in one book, but it doesn't know what the hell it is. Or I think it does know what it is, and it, but it's not the realms. So we'll see if things get uh, better and or different from here on out. Fingers crossed, I am going to remain optimistic. Next episode, let's talk about the first Neverwinter book from the Drizzt series and third edition as a whole. I don't know if I'm going to have a hell of a lot to say on that, but, you know, uh, this is this is our time. We're wrapping up third edition. As of the next book, we will officially be into the 15th century, and it's not quite all the way to the 4E jump, so I think it's a good point to uh, uh, to talk about things because we have now finished all of the big trilogies, taking us into 4E except for... Haunted Lands, but the last one of that is is a few years down the road, and so I think this is a, a good point to uh, to stop and talk about third edition because we're pretty definitively in fourth by uh, by next episode. So we'll we'll combine the two things because it's 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 kind of a good transitionary story, unlike the transitions trilogy, oddly. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.